Hello, folks. It's Michael with the CCERP podcast. He is in ecology. Hope you are doing well, making the most of this COVID nonsense situation we got to deal with. Um, got to quarantine, got to keep ourselves healthy, but damn, this is rough. Hope you're getting outdoors, um, making the most of that. Um, get some vitamin D, help you be healthy. So today, um, sensibly enough, I didn't mean to segue on that logically, but um, it turns out, yeah, like we're talking to Rose Holmes, a naturalist at Kikarello Misher Preserve, so we can learn a little bit about a place you can go to be outdoors, programs that can help you get engaged, you, your kids, neighbors in the environment, um, and outdoor activities, learn more what's in our area. So, uh, Rose, could you introduce yourself, please? Yes. Hi, thanks for having me today. Um, so my name is Rose Holmes. Uh, like Michael said, I am um, a naturalist with Harris County Precinct 4, and I am based out of the Kikarillo Misher Preserve, which, if you don't know, it is um, kind of at the intersection of 249 and Cypress Wood, um, just north of the Willowbrook area. Um, so I, my uh, role here at the preserve is a programs director, so I oversee all of the activities that the staff does where we hold uh, just basically public education, outdoor recreation experiences for the general public. So I think that we have the most fun job that you can have, <laughs> <Yeah>. especially <laughs> like if you're working for the county, we have a lot of fun with what we do. So uh, that's my primary role here right now. And there's two entrances to the park, right? North and south. That's correct. The main public entrance is off of uh, Cypress Wood, uh, not Cypress Wood, I'm sorry, off of Chasewood Park Drive. And so if you go to that entrance, that's where you'll find the most parking. We do have a smaller entrance that's off Cypress Wood that mainly just has enough parking spaces for staff and a few extra. So. And the small one near a fire station and near an old fire station and the other one has a, the entrance is a big sign curving yes, over the top yes. yeah they both yeah they both have big signs in front of them the the big entrance is right across from uh the chewies that's there off of um mm. casewood park drive and 249 so right there and then if you go in that entrance you got a variety of parking lots to choose from you go all, all the way to the end and there's a, a restroom um mm-hmm. you go you go in the one on cypress wood and no restroom available right there you got a bridge to go over to get to the park that's correct yeah so it's it's a nice walk, but you have to walk away if you need to get to the restroom or any other amenities like that. Mm-hmm. So, cool. Um, and we can get more into the park later, but that's what you do. So you're the boss. How many people do you have? How many underlings do you have? How many people <laughs> serve you? <laughs> so well, <laughs> we serve the public, right? Yeah. Uh, so there's myself and three other educational um, staff members here. So we're in charge of the programs. And then uh, the groundskeepers, we have a park manager, and he has, uh, I want to say, seven or eight caretakers. So they're the guys that are responsible for um, cleaning out the trash cans, cleaning the bathrooms, mowing the grounds. And they take care of Kikarillo as well as um, – three other park locations that are near us that just recently opened or will soon be opening. And what all do they do? Like the groundskeepers? uh, The groundskeepers? Um, So they they open the gates in the morning. They close the gate at night. Um, They're out patrolling the trails, patrolling the park, uh, greeting the guests, answering questions. They, They mow the grass. They keep the landscaping look nice. They clean the restrooms. They pick up trash. Um... If there's any kind of incident, they'll respond to those. Um, and then they go to the other park locations that are near hmm. us, and they do those same things there at those locations. So I know some people are very public-minded and public service-oriented and want mm-hmm. to keep those people um, employed. And so I know some of these people are kind enough to, like, throw a bunch of trash around the park, but actually the park employees have enough to do without people trashing the park. That's correct. Yeah, so we uh, <laughs> we do have enough to do, especially our, our staff. They take care of more than just this location. So we really appreciate people who practice the leave no trace and pack it in, pack it out. So yes, and I think um, I'm not sure. I got to look again, but 
I thought I saw in like the latest news, like a technological thing. There's actually like this technological breakthrough. There's this new invention called the trash can. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have a few of those. We're up on technology, so we have a few of those in the park. I think there's been some research where a lot of people know how to use one. A lot of people are really good at it, but it's really confusing for some people. They just, yeah, you know, this 20% <laughs> of the population or whatever, they just have a lot of trouble with it. I don't know. Yeah, some, sometimes. Sometimes, <laughs> yeah. So thank you to those who pick up their own trash or who pick up extra trash. Yes, yes we appreciate that. Yes. And people who like to come out and volunteer and just pick up trash for fun. Cool. Those folks are awesome. It's good exercise. Sunshine, multitask. Mm -hmm. Then you get to walk Absolutely. around the park and do something. you got mobility going, too. Yeah. Absolutely. And you see a lot of cool stuff when you slow down and walk hmm. the trails and pick up trash. You see a lot of cool things. Yeah. Stop and look what's around, plants, animals, all that. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, um, my cat's talking. I'll have to put my microphone in mute sometimes. <laughs> but, um, so, could you tell us about yourself, Rose, your background? Like, what made you? Sure. Is that something we can talk about? Is that a pretty? Yeah, or, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, okay, so some background about myself. Um, so, I grew up. <laughs> in the hill country in texas hmm. so that's uh, around like the blanco johnson city area hmm. nice. um so i grew up rurally um on it was only five acres but we grew up in a, a place that was like a divided ranch type of situation hmm. so so we had neighbors nearby um but all of our neighbors were a good walk away uh so i attribute a lot of my interests and what i went to for a career choice um, to how I grew up and being able to explore nature and not having, you know, you, you want to have some fun, you know, you got to look around you. So there's not places you can easily go to your friend's houses. You don't have the movie theater right down the street, you know, so you, you get outside, you explore nature. So I had that opportunity as a kid. And so I really think that's where my love of nature stemmed from. Um, and so I was active as well in, uh, like, the 4-H club growing up. So uh, we, we in a small town, you do that kind of thing, and you get to know animals really well. And um, so I decided early on that thinking about my career, I was not interested in a job where I had to go and sit behind a desk for eight hours a day every day. It just did not sound like something that I would enjoy doing. So I looked around to see what kind of careers were available to me, um, and I always thought it would be really great to be a ranch manager. So I kind of looked into cool. uh, some folks around me to see, you know, like what kind of knowledge do you need, what kind of background do you need. Um, so when I was choosing my my career choice in mind, that, that's kind of what I was thinking. So um, I went to, I transferred into Texas A&M. Um, to study rangeland ecology and management. And when I tell people what my degree is in, they're like, what does that mean, actually? Because it's a lot of words. But basically, it just means ecosystem science. Um, and so so my, my plan the whole time was to graduate from college, go back to the area where I kind of grew up in and live near my family and, um, you know, be outside all the time, manage a ranch, you know, dream job, right? Mm -hmm. um, so like life tends to happen, it throws you curves. And um, by the time that I was going to be graduating college, um, there was, I guess, kind of a recession in the economy. Um, I also had thought like going into ag extension agency was a good job as well with mm -hmm. benefits. Um, but during that year, that was in 2007, um, they were, they were going through budget cuts, and so a lot of positions were getting laid off, and they were going through a hiring freeze. So I thought, well, okay, maybe I will just stay in college for a little longer and see if <laughs> things improve. So um, I had an interest in the outdoors. I also have an interest in teaching others and interacting with others. So um, one of my advisors, you know, told me about the program in our ag department, which um, – students would go through and during the course of that program you actually earn a teaching certificate at the end hmm. and most people do that in their undergrad I had already you know finished my undergrad work so I was looking at grad school so 
um, in the ag department, they had an education, um, a master's in education. And so I decided to stay in school, get my master's of education, and then also get a teaching certificate, which is um, applicable for uh, like middle school through high school for teaching ag science classes. Hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what I did. I stayed in school, uh, which was really great. It opened up a lot of opportunities for me. And after I graduated, I had meantime I met my husband in college, and so I didn't end up getting to go back home. Now I live like in the Houston area because um, he already lived here. He had a good job here, so I stayed and I looked for a job that kind of fit my interests and my roles. And the county at that time was hiring for um, an education <laughs> programmer position, which basically is doing, you know, the job that I do now, where you get to have fun with folks, teach them about nature and the outdoors. So that's kind of my experience in a nutshell of, you know, kind of how I got influenced early on, where I ended up today. So... <laughs> And now so, I get to have a job where I get to go outside and enjoy the sunshine, teach others about nature. Cool. So you got a bachelor's and a master's? Yes. Yes. Cool. I was hoping you'd say something interesting, like you were one course away from finishing a master's and then ran off or something. Oh, man, no. <laughs> but finishing works, <laughs> I too. Figured, <laughs> yeah, you put, and there were times where I wanted to just quit. Sure, but, <laughs> yeah. But all that that money and effort and time into it, you it's worth sticking it out. <clears throat> yeah. So. Any interesting stories from when you were young? Any, like, traumatic, well, kind of terrifying or interesting um, outdoor stories? Animals, uh, landscape, hiking? Well, I, I was never really afraid of much as a kid, <laughs> and... <laughs> I don't remember this specifically, cool. but my parents tell me it happened, so I believe that it's true. But um, I used to pick up worms, and I would like to bring worms and bugs into the house. <laughs> and uh, apparently, at least one time, I don't know how many times it actually happened, but I actually brought baby snakes into the house as well. Was it um, a cute little and yellow and w red and yellow and black s s worm? No. I didn't know worms could be this color, Mom. Uh, look. <laughs> a baby cotton mouth. Huh. Wow. Well. So, so, but I guess, I guess nobody ever got bit, so That's good. <laughs> it huh. turned out okay, but yeah, cool. no, I was always bringing, bringing things into the house, so. Cool. But, yeah, Hill Country, beautiful place. Yeah, it is. But, um, so, anything else about your background or any other stories you want to share? Um, um, I guess I can share that I really think that, uh, other, other people's influences in my, in my life were really important. You know, so hmm. I, I can't, uh, you know, you can't ever think enough having a really good teacher or a really good positive mentor. Uh, we had a really great, um, county ag extension agent and, and so she was really, um, really good about positively influencing our 4-H club and impacting us and giving us good tips. So oh, yeah, I cool. just think, you know, kudos to all the good teachers out there, formal yeah. or informal. And then, yeah, I was going to ask, um, for some who might not know, what's a 4-H? It, it's 4-H is in horse, by the way, not forage. Oh, um, yeah, 4-H. So so you said it fast, and so the first thing I thought club. of was forage, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Foraging club. We yeah. got, we get mushrooms and or, plants. Yeah. yeah. But what is it? Um, so um, I think a lot of people are more familiar with the FFA. So the FFA is what is associated with public schools, um, and it stands for Future Farmers of America. And when people think of that, they think about, like, animal projects, but it's so much more than that. So the, the 4-H is kind of a um, akin program to the FFA and that you don't, it's not associated with the public school system. It's a club that anybody can join, um, mm. kind of similar to Cub Scout, or Boy Scouts or the mm. Scouts of America, I guess now it's called. Um, but the, the 4-H's stand for Head, Heart, Hands, Health. Oh. Um, and it, it teaches youth about the importance of community involvement, community service. Um, it, it helps you build skills 
for that are important later in life, uh, like public speaking. Um, I did a lot of public speaking competitions as a kid. Um, and then they have like your typical projects that you think of when you think of those kind of clubs where they're animal projects, which, you know, you, you have an animal, you raise it, you show it, and you try to get it to, to sale to market for scholarships and those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's kind of like a, a youth organization for um, developing leadership kind of skills. Mm -hmm. Cool. So <clears throat> um, back to the kicker, let me sure. So what can you tell us about the park? Um, what all is there? What opportunities do people have there? What can they do? What can they see? What can they learn? Sure. So so our park is a really small park considering everything else that is available around us. And it's really heavily used. People have found it. It's a beautiful little place. It's kind of like a, a hidden gem, which is maybe not so hidden anymore. Huh, yeah. Um, but we have, it's an 80-acre property, and 40 acres of it about is a lake. Um, so we have a lot of water. That, that's, that's the primary draw for people to come out. Um, but we have a, a paved trail that goes around the whole lake. It's ADA accessible. Uh, we have restroom facilities. We have a campsite that is available for reservation for nonprofit groups. So usually we get scouts that reserve it and camp out here. Um, sometimes we get church groups, things like that. You have to be a nonprofit to reserve it. And uh, if you have a, a camping reservation with us, we have restrooms that are available for y'all to use. There's a covered picnic area. There's a large group fire ring. It's really great for um, like scouts to use for Dutch oven cooking and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and and we've got a couple. We uh, now we have three fishing piers. Um, and other than that, that's really the only, um, you know, hard and fast amenities we have. We've, we've got, like, a sand volleyball court. We've got a gaga ball pit. We've got picnic tables. So we've got other things for people to do. Um, but we're called a preserve because when the property was donated to the county, we agreed that we would not do certain things with it hmm. and keep it its natural state as much as, sure. much as possible. So. So we, we aren't allowed to put, um, like, a playground on it. So hmm. we, we get asked occasionally sometimes, like, hey, are you guys ever going to get a playground? Because we get a lot of use for, for people, for families, for kids. Um, but unfortunately, and fortunately, I guess, depending on how you look at it, we're, we're never going to be able to actually put a playground in. So or you could look at them. A playground, you, you, could look at them with the, you could look at them with a confused look on your face and say, what? But this tree <laughs> and this stick, there's, like, the sticks. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, there's plenty to play there's with. There's sand yeah. and stuff, and like, there's a playground. Yeah. So, so if anybody wants like an actual playground, you got to visit a different <laughs> park. But, uh, yeah. um, but we've got a few natural trails, but most of our park is water. So um, we do have a, a public um, granite gravel boat launch where people can come and put in their own canoes or kayaks, any kind of boat that's non motorized. So people will come out and paddle the lake and they'll fish. Um, do those kind of activities um, and then we offer myself and my staff we offer uh, public programming that's available to anyone um, because of COVID right now everything that we do is registration required and mm -hmm. we have severely limited group sizes hmm. um, but during norm times five people we, 15 right so now? like 10 people is our mm -hmm. limited group size during COVID right now so that means that Whenever our, we open our programs for registration, they usually fill up really quickly. And then we have a Good. waiting list. Hmm. So, but, but people should still hmm. register on the wait list because we do, before we have a program, we reach out to everybody on the, on the registration list and see who's coming. And then if people say they can't, we contact people on the wait list. So, cool. so mm -hmm. we actively manage that. Um, but during normal times, if we don't have a, a reason to limit the group size, for supplies or anything, then we just open it up and on a, on a good day, on a good program during non COVID times, we can have, you know, maybe 40, 50 people for a program. Cool. Um, so, so we, we do a lot of fun things. Um, we like to educate about environmental topics, um, about wildlife topics. And then sometimes we just do recreation things because, um, if you can capture somebody's interest by giving them a little bit of fun, 
recreationally, then they want to come back. They want to learn more. And it kind of uh, it fosters that awareness to hopefully build that mindfulness of stewardship. So if they enjoy something, they want to preserve the land to make sure that they have the opportunity to continue to do that. So that can promote uh, good stewardship. So that's, that's my goal here is show everybody a good time, teach them a little bit if we can, and then what we're doing right now is we are growing and influencing the future of our our world. So mm-hmm. as much information as we can pass along, the better. Yeah, cool. How long is the trail around the ponds? Mile and a half, mile, or what? It's uh, one point <clears throat> seven miles, um, but that is that's including the long way around the big parking lot. So. If you hmm. if you take a shortcut, it cuts it off a little bit, but it's 1.7 miles. Um, and and sometime soon in the near future, hopefully within um, within the next year, we're going to get a trail continuation that's going to go outside of our park um, over to the hundred acre woods hmm. um, on on the north side of Cypress Creek, and then also on the south side of Cypress Creek. So that way we'll have a longer trail connection in. Uh, hmm. So right now it's only 1.7 miles. Hopefully it will be a bit longer than that in the near future. Hmm. How long, how far is it down from 100 acre from there? Uh, oh, I don't know that exactly. Um, it would probably hmm. be one way. It would probably be maybe between two and three miles, I think. Hmm. Cool. Um, what else is I going to ask about that? I was going to ask about the trail. Maybe I should have written some stuff down. Oh, well. But um, <laughs> was there a significant increase in the people coming out there once, like, COVID hit? Did you see, like, an uptick? People walking and stuff? Um, <clears throat> you know, I feel like we've always been really busy. Mm-hmm. We've probably had a little bit of an increase. Um, but generally, this, this park has been busy all the time anyways. It's, cool. It's it's quite um, difficult to find a place to park if you come, especially on the weekend on a nice day. But uh, even when the weather's bad, you still have those random folks that are out running the trails in the middle of a thunderstorm because <laughs> they don't know any better, I guess. But there's, <laughs> it's very rare that there's nobody in the park. But I, cool. I would say we have had a little bit of an increase during COVID, but we've been so busy already. Um, mm. It's, it hasn't it hasn't impacted it as much as I think others have some, seen. Yeah, some of your educational programs are in person, but you you do some stuff like uh, online too. Yeah, so so during the height of COVID, um, for I guess a couple months, we um, we suspended all of our programming, and so then we started looking at well, how can we still engage and reach the public virtually? So um, we did start using our Facebook page a lot more. Um, and just so everyone knows, we have an official Facebook page, and then we have an imposter Facebook page, <laughs> which Facebook created on its own, and it's not letting us claim. So hmm. if you're trying to find the official Facebook page, it's got to be kickerillo Misher preserve So it's got to have the dash in it. That's the official one. <laughs> um, Okay. But so we, we started utilizing our Facebook page a lot more, um, inviting folks to come out to the park, to interact with different um, questions we were posting, post their own photos, comment on our photos. And then our staff kind of dipped into the realm of like virtual programming. So we did um, some videos. Uh, so let's see, I did, a, I did a video on Poison Ivy lookalikes. Uh, I did one on uh, some common turtles you can see in our park. Uh, we did one on insects. Um, what else? We we did it. We did quite a few. We did a handful of videos. Um, I did a know before you go video about preparing for a uh, kayak or canoe trip. Um, and and all of those videos live on our Harris County Precinct Four YouTube channel. Oh, cool. um, so folks can visit that to find out some more information. But um, not just our department, but other departments in our precinct started doing those those online educational videos. So there's a lot of those that are available. Um, we didn't do quite as many actually live virtual programs, um, just because we thought that recording them would be a better way that we can get a lot more mileage out of those. Yeah. 
Uh, but it, it was definitely a learning experience. It was something that we have thought, you know, before COVID hit, we thought, hey, it would be cool to be able to do videos like this, but we hadn't really had the time or the opportunity. So when COVID hit, you know, it was like, all right, well, I guess we're going to try it and see how it goes. And we seem to have a decent response um, to the public. Uh, we definitely learned a lot. It, it takes a lot more time and energy and effort to do a recorded video than it would be just to get your stuff together and go do the program live for people. So mm -hmm. we did learn that. Um, but it, it was good. I think we had a good response. And um, we are doing programs again in person now since uh, June, I think, was when we started doing programs again. And I, I, we still have the op opportunity and the option to do some more videos and virtual things, but it's just, we like to spend our time outside. We don't <laughs> want to be yeah. in front of a camera, so. Yeah. So what did you do when the Poison Ivy look-alike thing? Um, so I talked about um, how to recognize Poison Ivy. We looked at um, some large mature leaves and some small young leaves. We looked at the vine. Um, and the plant that we looked at actually was growing mixed within a, a couple of look-alike plants. So uh, we talked about those look-alikes. I think the ones that we did was uh, Virginia oh. creeper and um, dewberry as look-alikes. Mm -hmm. so. so how would you tell? How would you describe to folks how they look alike and how to tell them apart? Okay, well it's kind of hard without looking at it, but um, <laughs> basically. A poison ivy, when it's young, has asymmetrical leaves, leafless, I guess I should say. Everybody always says, leaves of three, let it be. Well, they're actually leafless. Um, <laughs> but when they're young, they're asymmetrical, and the two outside leaves look like they have thumbs. They look like little mittens. Um, and the center leaf is more symmetrical. Um, and that uh, that still holds true as the leaves get larger and mature. We have We have several poison ivy vines that are about, um, man, about as big around as a, a soda can. They're really thick, and they have all these hairs all over them, reddish hairs. So even if you touch that, you could still get the, the chemical on your, your skin that could cause a rash if you're allergic. And when those vines get that size and they're up a tree, they produce these branches that look like they could be coming off the tree themselves, and they have these really big leaves that are about the size of your hand. Um, and when they get that size, they sort of lose their little thumb appearance, but the two outside leaves still are asymmetrical. So if you folded it in half down the center of the stem, they would not match, but the center leaf would. Um, so if you check out that video on YouTube, you get to see some of those, those examples and the larger things. But basically, you know, if you don't, I always just tell people, if you don't know what it is, just don't catch it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Dr. Mark Merriweather Fort Bruggen says, folks, there is such a thing as a stupid question. The question is, hey, <laughs> yeah. I, I ate this plant. What was it? <laughs> yeah, anything Don't is do it, please. You, want, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. And, it, and so make sure folks get it. Anything's edible once because you might not be alive to have anything edible after that. That's correct. <laughs> so please don't. Um, I'll try to find the video and link to it, put it in the show notes for folks. Um, cool. And I can send you links too. Okay, cool. That might make my life a little easier because I still have like this one, two, three, four podcasts I got to go through and do the show notes for, and it's going to take hours. <laughs> the pain, talk about being indoors, the pain, the pain, the pain. Yeah. But, um, so what about the turtles? You say you made a video about turtles. What kind of turtles you got there? Oh, uh, we have a lot of different kind of turtles. Um, the ones that we talked about in our video, we talked about a red ear slider, which is probably the most commonly seen turtle and the most well known. Um, and then we also had a box turtle. Uh, box turtles are terrestrial turtles and, um, just a couple weeks ago, I had somebody stop me in the park, uh, a park patron on a skateboard who came up to me and had this turtle. And, man, do you work here? And I, I think I found this turtle. Somebody told me that it might be somebody's pet and it might be lost. 
because when people think of turtles, they think all turtles live in the water. Um, hmm. But we have box turtles that live here, and they're native to here. And so I, I explained to her, you know, thank you for, for bringing this to me and showing this to me. You did good to ask and double check because it happens. Sometimes people release their pets here, even though they shouldn't. But um, so I explained to her, you know, it's a box turtle. It lives here. Please go go put it back where it came from because he's going somewhere to do something and he, he needs to know where his home is. Mm-hmm. Um, but so we have a, we talked about a box turtle. I have a, a young a juvenile box turtle that is a ambassador animal that we keep here to show. Um, and then we also had uh, caught a, a common musk turtle. Um, so those were the three that we talked about, but we have, um, we do have uh, common snapping turtles. We've got map turtles. We have musk turtles. We have mud turtles. Uh, shortly after Harvey, we even found an alligator snapping turtle in our parking lot. I was lucky enough to get some photos of, and we reported it um, to the uh, the Turtle Survival Alliance, who I think was doing surveys at the time for Texas Parks and Wildlife, studying them and their their locations and movement. Um, we have some soft shell turtles. Uh, we've got, I would say, maybe at least at least ten to twelve different species probably that live in the lake. Cool. Are, are the alligators protected? Um, alligator well, snapping turtles. The alligator. Oh yes, the alligator snapping turtles. Um, yes, they are. I believe the last I checked, they're still an endangered species, um, so they are protected. So you, you're not allowed to um, hunt them, remove them, anything like that without the proper permit. Yeah, so leave them alone, please. Um, yes. And and take a photo and send it to Parks and Wildlife because they are studying um, where they live. Cool. Um, what about the insects? You say you made a video about insects. What did you cover in that? Yeah, so um, it was one of my, my staff members actually made a video about insects. Um, she used some some of the bugs that we grow in house. Um, so she, I think she used some mealworms for those, which when they grow out, they're actually darkling beetles. Hmm. Um, so she talked about um, what makes an insect an insect. So you know, six legs, two antenna, usually two eyes, sometimes more. Um, and then I, I believe she talked about metamorphosis in it as well, so the different life stages. Mm-hmm. What other kind of animals do you have there? Animals and plants? In the park? Yeah. Um, so a lot of people are really surprised when they see deer in the park. Um, I, I guess most people don't realize they can still live and thrive in, in kind of an urbanized area. Hmm. Um, but that's what the greenways are here for, is to provide habitat and space. But um, so we do have some white-tailed deer in the park. Um, we do have coyotes. And we just have recently seen them, even out during the day. So usually huh, they're cool. crepuscular animals. Um, I usually see them at dusk when I, if I stay here late and leave late, I'll, I'll see them hanging out along the creek. But we've been seeing them during the day. So I don't know if they're uh, extra hungry, if they're trying to fatten up for winter or what. Um, but we do see coyotes here pretty frequently. And every now and then we'll get really lucky and we'll see a bobcat. Cool. Um, so we do have bobcats that um, are living in our area. Um, I, I have not seen any um, feral hogs, which is a really great sign. Yeah, thank goodness. But we do have feral hogs that live in other areas um, of our precinct. Um, we have at least two resident beavers that live in our lake. Cool. Um, so if, if you come out early in the morning or just before closing, um, they're nocturnal animals, and they'll start coming out. Um, right before closing. So if you come out at those times, sometimes you can see them swimming around on the water, and if you disturb them and startle them, you can hear them. They'll they'll use that big tail and make like a slapping sound on the water. Um, so so sometimes you see or you hear them before you can see them. Um, we've got lots of different bird species. We have a lot of different types of um, water wading birds, um, and then we have a bunch of migrants that come through as well. What are some um, of the wading birds? So our, probably our most noticeable is the great egret, and it's the largest solid white bird. It's our largest wading bird um, right there next to the great blue heron. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't 
see great blue herons every day, um, but they, they, they hang around here. Um, so we have the great egret. That's our biggest bird we see all the time. Um, we've got some snowy egrets. We have got some um, little blue herons. We've got some, uh, I think we have some red herons, or I'm sorry, the green herons mm -hmm. that come by here as well. Uh, we have yellow crown night herons. Um, and then we have a lot of songbirds. We have a lot, we have some raptors, um, owls, cool. things like that. Uh, we do have an osprey that's living nearby, and cool. we've seen awesome. him pretty regularly recently. So cool. It's a cool sight. And every now and then, we get lucky and we see a bald eagle. But it's it's been probably the better part of a year since um, any of our staff has seen a bald eagle around. But every now and hmm. then, um, I think maybe the eagles from Tom Ball come a little bit south to see us. Hmm. Cool. Um, do folks share stories or sightings or pictures of? animals with you yeah um so so usually you know we're, we're out in the park um doing programs several times a week so it's a good opportunity to interact with the public that's there so we'll if we see people taking pictures or fishing you know we'll stop and we'll talk to them and we'll ask them you know like what kind of fish are biting or you know they'll they'll show us some photos so we do have some regular folks that come out um you know on a weekly basis maybe sometimes more and um, so they've, they've shared some really cool photos with us. Uh, there was one man who was down here um, shortly after Harvey, and he was stationed here. He worked for FEMA. Um, and so I, I got to know him because he was out here every day after work, and he even ended up buying a kayak. Huh. And so he would come and kayak out here after work, and he start, he got into photography. Um, so before he, he was only here for six months, that's how long his um, – his uh, assignment here was so before he left after his six months he he gave me a um, a zip drive with all of his good photos on it huh, to share wow. and use so, nice. cool. so it's it's not uncommon if we we see people in the park a lot of people we see are out here um you know just kind of getting into photography it's a hobby and they're really excited about the wildlife that they see and about sharing their photos so it's really good do people share it a lot on facebook and instagram under like kikarillo misher yeah, they do. Um, but you know, sometimes they get our imposter Facebook page. So, um, yeah, yeah. but, but yeah, people do, they share a lot of their photos. Cool. And then haven't some people seen, um, river otter out there? Um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised. I personally have not seen them out here, but I know they live around here. Mm -hmm. So I would not be surprised if they were nearby. Yeah. I know at one time on the gully, um, Months ago, I saw some river otter scat. Yeah. So. I believe it. They live here. That's one of those animals that's really elusive, and it's. Uh, I get really jealous when other people see things like that. And I, like, <laughs> for the longest time, yeah. I, I did not actually see a beaver here, you know, probably until, like, maybe a year ago. Huh. Because everybody else had seen this thing. <laughs> I still have not seen it. So they're there, you know. It's just what can you actually see? Being at yeah. the right place at the right time. Yeah, I know what you mean. Same. I'm on these all these different animal biology groups on Facebook, and people are posting all these pictures. So it makes it seem seem like it's like an everyday thing because there are all these pictures. But you know, it's like they're one rare opportunity that you're seeing and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So, but it makes me jealous anyway. Yeah. Like someone, one time someone posted, um, I hope it's okay to post this picture here or something, something or whatever. And it was a joke and I made it clear. I go, no, I hate you. Why did you do this? I'm so jealous. And of course, she just did the <laughs> laugh, you know, but she understood. But yeah, it's like, I'm going to see a cotton mouth. No. Yeah. The pain, the pain. <laughs> Don't rub it in. But. Mm. Yeah, but, probably the, the coolest thing I ever, well, there's a couple of cool things I got to witness. This was before I was at Kikarillo when I was, I started um, in the parks department over at Jesse Jones Park hmm. in Humble, hmm. where there's a lot, a lot more room to roam in different habitats. And, that was before um, Harvey? I, that was before Harvey, yeah. Um, I got to witness a, um, I think it was a red ear slider. I got to witness a, a slider turtle burying some eggs. Cool. And then covering them up again. Cool. Like laying them, covering them, leaving. It was really cool. 
Right. And then I also got to witness, um, and I got video of, it was kind of sad, um, it was a diamondback water snake eating a frog, and this poor frog was screaming the whole way down. Huh. Uh, but, wow. you know, like, how often do you get to see things like that? It's yeah. nature. Yeah. Cool. And it's like, people are all sheltered um, from life, which is bad in some ways, because we depend on the same thing. We might think, oh, that's so cruel, but, I mean, what do you think you do to get your vegetables and your meat? It's not just meat. Mm -hmm. It's like, it takes a whole lot of habitat destruction, fundamentally destroying a lot of animals and plants to grow wheat and soybeans or whatever vegetables we eat. Um, mm -hmm. It's not all copacetic. Yeah. Thankfully, there are some farmers who do it really well. Um, some people are more scientific and ecological. Um think more about ecology the way they should instead of thinking it's all chemistry but uh yeah yeah that's a different story anyway <laughs> yeah one time along cypress creek i saw something i couldn't get a video of but kind of like you say it was super awesome i'm not sure what kind of snake it was but it had this fish in its mouth it was incredible because like the snake was holding on to the side of the fish and the fish must have been like the side of the fish must have been like 10 or 20 times as big as the surface area of the fish's mouth and it was swimming wow. around with it it was incredible <laughs> and i thought i could get a little close to take a um a video but i didn't know the snake's vision was that good so it was going towards the bank but it saw me and then swam away um yeah i was like no i should have just started <laughs> taking a video right there and just got what i could that, that yeah. hurt my heart man that hurt my heart yeah, the one that got away. <laughs> the many that got away. That's not the only one. Mm. All the butterflies and dragonflies that can't get close enough to, you know, all the swallowtails I want to take a picture of, but they just go flitting on by, or I'm walking down yeah, the trail, quick. and all of a sudden, like even today, I'm walking down, and I'm looking up, and all of a sudden this gulf fritillary flies like within inches of me, whoosh, right by you know, it's like I'm looking up at a tree and it's about four feet up and it flies right by and all I do is see it in my peripheral vision for like a split second, like then it's gone, you know. Yeah. For for being so small, those things are quick. <laughs> yeah. And of course all that jaggedy motion. It's not like nice and smooth like a jet plane or something. It's like whoosh, veering all over the place. But <clears throat> not remember what else. Some snakes have been like that too. Wanted to take some pictures of some snakes sometimes, but they just move too quick sometimes. Yeah, if they, and if they see you, you know, if, if they know what's good for them, they'll be gone. Yeah, yeah. They're a lot more scared of us than we are of them. Mm-hmm. People might not believe that, as terrified as some, some people are of snakes, but they are more scared. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... What about the naturalists that work there? What are their names, and can you tell us like, about them and what they do? Sure. Um, so there's uh, three other naturalists here. Um, not all of them consider themselves naturalists because uh, not all of them have backgrounds in uh, biology or sciences, um, but they, they do know a lot about uh, education, a lot about nature, um, so the, the first staff member I hired after I came on, his name is Gerald Geisler. Um, he actually retired from his job with the city of Houston. He used to work at the hmm. Waterworks um, Education Center. Hmm. So he had a lot of experience um, educating folks. He had a lot of knowledge about water quality um, and wastewater and, um, you know, treatments and things like that and pollution. Um so that's, that's his background. He spent a lot of years with the city. Um, and some of his hobbies that he uh, enjoys doing, which kind of influenced the, the classes that he chooses to teach out here, um, have to do with art and photography. Um, and then, of course, he, he likes to do um, a lot of the, um, the environmental education stuff as well. Um, he has taken an interest in the scouting programs as well. His hmm. uh, when. He's got a son, a, a grown son, who used to be in the scouts. So he was heavily involved in scouts. So um, he handles a lot of our Eagle Scout projects. If we get contacted by folks who want to do a project, he'll 
he'll take on the project and, and handle it. Um, but he teaches a lot of uh, the scouting programs as well. Um, the second staff member I hired about a year after that, uh, her name is Ashley DeLeon, um, and she um, she enjoys doing a lot of educational classes that also involves the arts um, and that involves um, probably the, the preteen um, and younger than that. She really enjoys working with that age group. Um, she does some classes that are about um, nature journaling, reflecting on observations, and learning from nature that way and building skills. Um, she likes, uh, there's a, a preschool class that she does that's um, it's called Lakeside Library. Uh, so she does a, a story time by the lake and then they'll usually do a craft or an activity and go on a hike and see what kind of things that, that can be found. Um, and she, she has also gotten into bugs as well. Um, so she is our resident keeper of our dubia roaches and our Madagascar hissing cockroaches. Um, <laughs> she's got a tarantula as well. So, cool. um, so she's interested in those kind of programs too. Um, and then our newest hire, um, she's been with us about a year now, is Kirsten Katusin. Um, and she is, she has a, um, a master's in geology. So she's hmm. a geologist. Interesting. Cool. Uh, yeah. And so, so she brings a lot of technical knowledge to our team in the earth sciences. So she likes to do a lot of programs that are geared for um, probably ages eight to 10 and up. And uh, so she teaches classes. Uh, she's got one that's really fun for all ages called pet rocks. And so she goes through a whole geology lesson, talk about different rocks. Um, and then at the very end, the kids actually get to make and paint their own pet rock. Um, but she's also very active in the outdoors. And she, she on her own uh, free time, she likes to do a lot of backpacking and hiking and things like that, camping programs. So um, she she brings that into the programming as well. So she'll, she teaches a lot of our orienteering classes. Um, there's a, a series that she does called Find Yourself Outdoors where she covers different topics about um, – you know, setting up a tent, uh, backpacking basics. Um, we've got one coming up um, in a couple weeks about um, cooking in the outdoors. Um, so we have a really varied background of knowledge and experience, and so I feel like we have a really well-rounded um, program. Hmm. So, do y'all work individually on certain programs mostly, or do y'all work together on some stuff a lot, or what? Um, for most of our programs, um, we prepare them individually, but for every program that we teach, we have a partner with us, another colleague. <laughs> that way, um, you know, because we're out in the park, we're, we're by ourselves, so yeah. we want to make sure if, if there's an emergency or something were to happen, that there's somebody who can handle the situation and not interrupt the program. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of our programs, we'll, we'll develop them ourselves, um, and we may seek input from others, um, you know, get them to help us out with a certain thing. Um, so most of those we plan ourselves, and then we just, we, in, we incorporate our, our teaching partner um, once we do the actual class. There's a, there's a few programs that are a little bit more involved that we plan together. Um, those are kind of like the team programs. Um, right now, because of COVID, our, our really our only group program that we do together are the star parties, the park mm -hmm. after dark event. Mm -hmm. uh, so usually for those, we, we work together and somebody will take on, you know, the activity, the craft activity for that. And somebody else will take on, you know, the the telescope portion, setting it up, doing that instruction. Somebody else will take on, um, you know, the the talk that we give around the fire while we're eating s'mores. So so for some programs, we everybody gets involved. Um, but for a lot of the programs we do, it's just one staff preparing their program they're going to teach. How long has Gerald been there? Um, let's see, since 2018, I think. I came over here in 2017. And that's when the park um, opened, of course, 2017? Yes, and I, and I think, I think, he, he, I hired him shortly after Harvey. Harvey was in 2017, right? Or was it 2018? <laughs> I forgot. It's like, some of it yeah, all blurs was, together. Yeah, was, I think was, it was 2017. Was the great drought before Harvey, or was Harvey after the drought? I forget. Yeah, they all, they all run together. Now COVID, you know. <laughs> Yeah. But it, it's been he's been here um, he's been here about three years I think. Hmm. So three years sounds about right though for Harvey. Yeah. But cool. What about Ashley? 
Um, she's been here two years. I, I think they all they all have starting dates like towards the end of the year, like September, <laughs> October, November, maybe. So they're all about huh. a year apart for hiring. So I think Gerald's been here three years, Ashley's been here two years, and Kirsten's been here just over a year now. Huh. Funny. So. Yeah. Yeah. And you're all filled up, so you can't hire another one. Yeah, until we get a nature center or another building where we can we can hold cool. more staff. Cool. You know, we're kind of at our at our limit here. Is that a possibility getting a nature center? Yeah. So so cool. actually, in the whatever the the county receives this property as a donation, there was a a master plan for it that was agreed upon, and hmm. in the master plan is the future of a nature center, um, and that was all drawn up before Harvey. So, like. A lot of things like Harvey changed what could be possible for a lot of places. So yeah. uh, the whole park flooded during Harvey. Mm -hmm. And if you, you go to the park and you stand in the back parking lot where the restrooms are, and if you look at the doors on the restrooms, about where the lock is on the bathroom doors was the water level at its backs during Harvey. Hmm. Wow. So, so that means that any nature center we do build is going to have to be elevated somehow. Yeah. So that just adds a little bit of complication. So um, the nature center is not a, any anything new or any anytime soon going to happen. It's going to take a while. So so we're we're set at what we can do for staff wise for the time being. Because yeah, didn't um, Jesse Jones and maybe what Spring Creek Preserve or whatever I forget what it's called now didn't they suffer a lot of damage to their nature centers during Harvey? Oh yes, definitely. Yeah, like yeah. Maybe a they um, bobcat or something, and all this. Yeah, they. There was a lot. Um, well, I mean, every, we we all prepare. Anytime there's a risk of it possibly flooding, we prepare for flood. So everybody was prepared, but we Not received way more water than was expected. Yeah. So yeah. I think they had like six feet of water in their nature center at Jesse Jones. Wow. Um, so they had moved things up, but not six feet up. Yeah. So, hmm. so a lot of things were able to be salvaged and saved, but unfortunately, Good. they did lose. They did lose some things. Hmm. Well, but I guess it's uh, preparation it's for nature, next time. man. Yeah. Now they yeah. know they have a higher. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now we know what's possible. If we ever get another another Harvey, <laughs> we know what to prepare for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's. A general thing. It's not just this. Um, comes up in even economics and finance. As much as some of them people are into finance and economics and thinking they got things right and taking it really seriously, accounting for contingencies because they use more of a um, some of them. It's not so much anymore, mm -hmm. but because they use used a normal model for emergencies, thinking that these extreme events are very unlikely, they didn't prepare, and that can cause some yeah. major financial disasters. So they learn they got to go with a what's called a greater tail on the upper end of the curve um, to uh, think that there's more possibility that they should actually prepare for. Um, yeah. But same thing. Um, cool. So what are the programs you got there? You got um, tell us about the star watching. Like you only have one telescope there that y'all provide, and then other people bring their own, or what? Yeah, so, so we, the county, um, well, our park has a telescope. There's another department um, called Trails as Parks that travel around. They have their own telescope as well. Um, so we, we do have a telescope and we set it up, but whenever we have these events, we also invite some of um, the local folks to come and volunteer and participate. So cool. um, most of the time we're able to get people who are with the North Houston Astronomy Club hmm. that come out cool. and volunteer um, our most recent star party was actually this past Monday. Hmm. Um, so what's happening right now is the Leonids meteor shower. Um, it's, it's peak time was around the 16th or 17th of this month, but I believe that you can still see it some, uh, through the end of the month. If you get into an area that's dark enough, unless you're um, lazy like me and you like to go to bed early. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, forget peak it. Viewing hours, yeah. Peak viewing <laughs> hours is after midnight. So we don't stay out that late. We, we have a program that celebrates it. We didn't actually see any meteor showers, but we were prepared for not seeing anything. But we still, you know, we had a program to celebrate it, and we invited someone um, out from the North Houston Astronomy Club. So we, we have a craft that teaches about, um, and, and every single park after dark or star party we do is different because it, it's, 
hmm. focused on whatever astronomically is happening or whatever the season is happening. Um, but so we, we had a staff member who taught a craft that taught about um, the planets, asteroids, um, meteoroids, meteors, comets, what the difference is, where you can find them. Um, we, we, and then we did some s'mores by the fire, and we talked specifically about the Leonid meteor shower. And um, after that, our volunteer from the North Houston Astronomy Club did a green laser light tour and pointed out some notable stars and planets and um, some of the uh, constellations. Um, so it's really great. Everybody, everybody learns a lot at our star events, and we have cool. a great time. Um, what can you see with the telescopes? You can see all the planets, their moons, or like what? Yeah. So, so because of our location, we still have quite a bit hmm. of. Um, we're, we're 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 technically we're still in the city limits right here, so we still hmm. have a lot of light pollution. So hmm. unfortunately, we can't see a whole lot. Hmm. Um, but usually when we take our telescope out, we're at least able to see um, Mars, Saturn, and Jupiter. Cool. Um, and so, so we usually look at those. If the moon is out, we'll look at some features on the moon. Um, but, but we can see um, the rings of Saturn. We can hmm. see the moons of Jupiter. Um, and this last time, our, our volunteer with the, uh, the astronomy club, he showed us where to find. Um, there's a pair of stars in the sky that's in... Um, the Swan constellation, which is called Cygnus, I believe, um, mm -hmm. and he showed us where to find those pair of stars. And if you put your telescope on them, you can—it's a good example to show folks of different colors of stars because oh, one cool. of them is yellow and one of them is blue. Oh wow, pretty cool, neat. So yeah. you, can, you can only see the colors with your telescope; they're not visible to the naked eye. Um, you can a little bit, um, like if you look up in the sky, hmm. you can, you, with the naked eye, you can see, you can see Mars. It just looks like a really bright star. Oh, and but it I mean, kind the, of, the yellow and the blue. Yellow and red. Yeah. Yeah. The colors look like I to me, Mars with the naked eye looks a little bit reddish. Mm -hmm. And if I look over at where Saturn and Jupiter are, they look more white. Yeah. Um, but yeah, to the naked eye, some stars look blue. Some stars look red. Some stars look yellow. And it's all because of the um, the chemical composition, yeah, what so colors cool. they burn. Yeah, like candles and metals and stuff. People can look it up on YouTube if they want to see different metals being burned, yeah. different colors. Yeah, cool. And um, people do birding programs out there. Some people come and do like a monthly birding walk or something. Yeah, so we, we do have the, um, the Audubon. Uh, the Houston Audubon Society, they come out once a month um, on the third Monday of every month. They come out in the morning and they, they meet out near the restrooms and then they do a, a birding walk around the trail and anybody's welcome to join them. Um, and, and so that one is usually a bird, just basically a bird watch, a bird count. Um, but most of the folks that come expect novices to come. So anybody who is interested in bird watching and doesn't know much about it, um, it's a great way to come out and get some tips from some experienced birders. Um, yeah, I haven't nice. taught it in a while, but hmm. I, I used to teach a beginning birding class. Cool. Um, so maybe in the in the spring, I'll teach that again, teach you all the ins and outs of what you need to know to identify birds. Cool. Uh, but this is a, a good spot to come out and go bird watching. Yeah, and they're nice. Um, I've been to some at club and very, very nice people mm -hmm. willing to help and point things yeah. out and repeat things a number of times if you're not used to whatever and it takes a while to sink in. You know, I know when I started looking at plants and animal tracks years ago, my brain was had zero ability to deal with it. I can deal with all these other things, math and all this stuff, but art, color, shape, not. And yeah. for, for some, and I know for some reason, the way my brain was when I was growing up, I couldn't identify the shapes of leaves. People would try to teach me like one kind of tree versus another. I just could not get it. No matter how hard I tried, mm -hmm. not my fault, just my brain. And um, so, you know, I had to ignore that and get over it and know that I can learn and stick with it and just care about it and be curious. And yeah, um, after a while, like my subconscious, my brain, finally learned and got the patterns down and <laughs> learned how to recognize that. But, um, yeah, 
a lot of it is, is learning where to look and what details to notice. And yeah, true. Yeah. So. And it's in our nature. It's not like some can do it and some can't. It's like um, to survive as humans and to have evolved, we wouldn't be here unless we could all do it. It's That's in right. Us. It allowed us to survive. But um, what time do they meet um, to do the burning? Um so typically um, in the, the summertime, the spring and summer, they meet at 7.30. Mm -hmm. um, I believe it's 7.30. Um, and then in the wintertime, once it starts to get darker, um, I'm sorry, light a little later and a little colder, they usually meet at 8. Hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So, But that information is all on our, um, our website. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you go to hcp4.net slash kmp, um, there's a link to all of the programs that we're offering that month, and cool. we have that information for the Audubon um, Society on there as well. No, and that's where some... people can go to register as well. Cool. I'll put some links to that in the show notes, make it easier for people when I get around to it. Awesome. I can't promise it'll be awesome. up when I publish the podcast right away, but eventually <laughs> the links will be there for folks. Um, cool. But, well, cool. It's getting on about time you need to hit the road and go home. Um, yeah. Do you got any last word for folks about the park or animals or enjoying nature or anything? My last words would be to share something that I think everybody should know that maybe a lot of people are just not aware of. And that is the importance of um, observing nature from a distance and leaving no trace and keeping wildlife wild. Um, so we've, we've, We've got some situations in a lot of our parks where people like to feed wildlife, they like to collect things and take them home. Um, and really, to keep our, our parks and our environment sustainable, you want to leave everything as you find it, unless it's trash, of course. Uh, leave everything as you find it. Um, if you take something in, bring it out, and just please don't feed the wildlife because it's not good for them, it's not good for you, it changes their behavior, and it could pose a risk to people. Um, so those are the things that I would close with. And then also enjoy nature. There's a lot of people that um, are kind of scared to get outside. And, and mm -hmm. if you can go experience nature safely on the trails, um, you know, enjoy it. Get out and learn about it. Um, the more you learn about something, the less you are afraid of it. And then remember that the individual person might be afraid, but it is in the nature of every one of us to be adventurers, to survive and thrive. Otherwise, we'd never be where we are. Um, we would have been wiped out millennia ago. Mm, that's right. Um, so just remember, that's what's inside you. Just It's not anything different. Just overcome the fear and be what you are. Homo sapiens, human being. Um, yeah. And, and get outside your comfort zone a little. Yeah. That's how we make life better. I know... That's happened to me some in life. I'm not going to go there, but yeah, things I've done. <laughs> Pushing the envelope has made me a better person, giving you more confidence, seeing more about what, what life's really about. But And then really quickly on the feeding things, yeah, if people, it's nice as humans, we want to help. We want to cooperate and engage and help others. It's like human nature, part of it. Um, mm -hmm. but in doing that, then it, even though you might not be thinking about it, the consequence is that you're training animals to expect food from some humans. And if they don't get it, then it's like, they're like, what the hell? You're supposed to give me food. Where's the food? Come on, give me food. You know, like if yeah, you went to a restaurant, people. if you went to a restaurant and you order something and you pay them, you're going to be upset if the restaurant doesn't give you food. <laughs> The animals are just doing the same thing. Absolutely, yeah. We we have squirrels here that they uh, they get fed a lot, and they also actually get food out of the trash can. So mm -hmm. we may have to get covers for our lids. But uh, yeah, they they expect to be fed by people, and they'll chase people, and they'll even jump on them and climb on them, and, huh, wow. and then that, that that poses a risk for people getting bit. Which unfortunately, squirrels can carry some diseases hmm. that can be transmitted to humans. So then you've got a whole other problem there. So, yeah, people think that they are doing good, and it's it's a lot of times it's well-intended, but they just don't understand the adverse effects that could happen. Yeah, 
And then oh. if the squirrel does crawl on someone, besides being bit, a lot of people are going to be scared. They're going to back off. They could run into someone else, fall over. Um, mm -hmm. Some people who aren't as healthy, that could cause a major health problem, a major injury, I should say. Ambulance might yep. have to be called out. Um, so yep. think about that. Um, let the squirrel be a squirrel. Observe it from a yep. distance, as you say. Cool. Good. All right. Awesome. So more to talk about, but um, so much that we talked about already. That's awesome. Thank you, Rose. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed sure. it. Yeah, likewise. So appreciate your time. Hope you have a good day and a good weekend and um, talk to you all soon. All right. Sounds great. Thanks. Thanks.